first of all, I want to thank Simone Bianco for accepting our invite, also considering the nine hour difference in time. So thank you very much, Simone. Uh, let me introduce Simone very briefly. He is a research manager of the Department of Functional Genomics and Cellular Engineering at IBM Almaden a Research Center, which is in San Jose, California. His main research interests are in theoretical evolutionary biology, especially the evolution of RNA viruses and cellular engineering. Simone is a, a PI for IBM and side director of the Center for Cellular Construction, which is an NSF science and technology center in partnership with UC San Francisco, UC Berkeley, Stanford University, San Francisco State, and the San Francisco Exploratorium. Um, yeah, so I actually have been working two years with Simone uh, as a postdoc in, uh, in, uh, in, his, in his group. So please, Simone, we can start. Thank you, Vito. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for uh, uh, for attending and uh, for the invite. <clears throat> I'm um, very happy to um, uh, to give a talk. Um, um, I have actually uh, I have uh, I'm linked to the University of Genoa. Um, I've been linked to the University of Genoa for some time. Um, when uh, when I when I when I arrived here in San Francisco, and uh, um, I, I think after I joined IBM. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the scientific delegate of the consul uh, was Massimo Maresca, who's professor at the University of Genoa. And uh, um, we established a great partnership um, with several centers uh, that are linked to the university that have been very successful. And so I'm uh, very happy to be virtually there. Um, I have to confess I've never visited the university, although I um, I was a student in Pisa, so close enough for me to, to come, and I'm, but I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully someday come and, uh, uh, and visit and visit uh, your center as well. <clears throat> so I want to apologize again. I'm um, a little sick. Uh, I know it's not COVID because I'm vaccinated, but I know it's something else because my kids are sick. And so hopefully um, this will not be too bad. So, um, so today, uh, as Vito was saying, my, my group does an, a number of different things. So today I'm going to show you research related to one of the two projects, the main projects that I lead. Uh, so first of all, I want to tell you where I am. Um, uh, let me see. You can see my, my pointer, right? So, um, uh, so I work for IBM Research, which is the largest, world largest IT, IT research organization in the world. Uh, my lab is here in Almaden, uh, close to San Jose, uh, south of San Francisco. Uh, but IBM has a global presence um, with research that spans uh, a number of uh, different fields. And um, research in IBM is, is very academic. Uh, we have um, six uh, Nobel Prize winners, including one in my building, W. Mourner. Um, and the building is here. It's really nice. It's on top of, the, of a hill in the uh, Santa, Clara, Santa Clara area. Um, and the, the research that we do there uh, spans several, as I was saying, several uh, fields. Um, <clears throat> uh, the research that I'm going to present is also part of uh, this uh, uh, NSF funded science and technology center called the Center for Se Cellular Construction. Um, it's a $50 million center uh, um, that was funded by the NSF to uh, develop a new field of, uh, uh, of research. And as uh, Vito was saying, uh, it, it joins um, uh, uh, several institutions and brings together researchers from all these very nice institutions. So if you want more information, uh, this is the uh, link uh, to the website. The center was just renewed for five more years. So, so uh, our research is going to be funded by the NSF until 2026. So there's a lot that is coming uh, in this kind of research. So <clears throat> the main focus of this center is to develop, as I was saying, a new scientific discipline. Let me try and introduce it to you uh, through an example. So um, if, you, um, if you think about um, the way products are made, you know, chemicals are made, um, usually we, we, we think about a, a chemical engineering factors. So these are places where um, you basically have a number of interesting inputs coming in, coming in, a number of important inputs coming in. And as an output, you have a number of important outputs. Um, uh, as, um, 
a, an analogy in biology, yes. um, the cell is also a chemical engineering factory. It is uh, uh, a, a, an entity, an entity that uh, uh, processes a number of inter internal and external inputs to produce useful outputs. Of course, it does it for itself unless we um, uh, we modify it uh, appropriately. And, and in, in, again, inside this analogy, uh, both the chemical engineering factory and the cell have a number of important properties. Um, they can interact with other cells or other factories. They can um, uh, um, um, they can change if changing the uh, the the sides and the number of the internal structures. They can change their yield, uh, and of course they do in some sense reproduce. Although the cell reproduces autonomously, autonomously. Um, but there is a notable difference. So <clears throat> if we have an idea of how the chemistry of a specific product uh, happens, we know exactly how we have to make a chemical engineering factory to produce that product. The same is not true for the cell. Even if we have <clears throat> a complete knowledge of the chemistry of the cell, we have no idea of how to, we have to engineer a cell so that it, it produces something for us. And so you may be asking yourself, do cells really produce things uh, for us? And the answer is yes. So we use cells to do all sorts of things from um, um, drugs, uh, for example, penicillin, uh, to, um, um, uh, to, to um, food related products uh, like additives and sugars, to um, um, uh, products that are used in cosmetics like um, um, additives to our toothpaste is uh, our toothpaste, for example, uh, to even um, uh, synthetic and plastic product, uh, uh, of course, biopolymers, um, um, as in the case of companies like Zymogen or uh, or Emirates, so biopolymers. Uh, and so, the the aim of of our research and the aim of this center. Uh, let me move my picture from so I can actually see. Um, is to develop a new scientific discipline called cellular engineering, which really aims at transforming cell biology into a more quantitative field um, using tools from engineering, physics, mathematics, and computer science, um, with the aim of um, designing and building cells that have specific three-dimensional structures. Um, so in other words, the, in, in cartoons, what we want to do is to be able to um, uh, deconstruct the prime principles from a diverse set of, my, of morphology, uh, mor morphologies that we observe in nature using what evolution has shaped in, shaped in the last four billion years to understand the, the primitive rules. So um, how do you have to, okay, I really need to take my pictures, my picture off, sorry, <laughs> to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to understand the primitive, the primitive rules, the, gen the general rules uh, that compose uh, what is observed in nature to be able then to construct completely new things. So in, in the analogy of a cell, we, we want to understand um, how a cell or how multiple cells really assemble themselves so that we are able to assemble them um, uh, de novo to, to make new things. And, and in order to do this, we want to use, of course, mathematics, physics, and computer science, as I'm going to show you um, in, um, in a few slides. Uh, so I just, I, I didn't say at the beginning. So if, if you please, um, uh, we can keep this informal. So if you do have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, uh, answer. We don't have to wait until the end. Um, so, so what is the impact of this discipline? So it has, a, of course, a number as we, uh, we understand uh, understand it today, and it may have a number of uh, important um, outcomes, both uh, let's say vertically across, uh, vertically within industries, and horizontally across disciplines and across industries. So, from the point of view of basic science, uh, we think it will revolutionize um, the way um, we think about, of course, image analysis, but also data and storage. About AI, as hopefully I'm going to show you. Uh, later, in terms of physics, uh, the role of noise is, of course, very important. There is no scientific discipline that really studies noise in biological system. Um, we want to approach, uh, we want to find new ways to use dynamical systems in, uh, um, in biology. And of course, cellular molecular biology, as I was saying before, as in pertains to cellular self-assembly. 
Um, we think cellular engineering will contribute a number of new tools. Uh, most, uh, more import most importantly, um, <clears throat> tools like computer-aided um, design of biological uh, structures. But also we think that um, um, looking deeper at how cells really assemble the cells at multiple scale may be important, for example, for new scientific paradigms, for example, in the, in the case of quantum computing. Uh, and of course, um, we think this will impact and is already impacting a number of disciplines, um, a number of uh, in industrial, um, um, uh, a number of industrial fields. In the case of healthcare, as I'm going to show you in a, in, in a moment, we think uh, having rational design of cells will be important for cell therapies, for example, in cancer, uh, but also in, uh, in um, fields that are a little bit less related to health, like environmental monitoring. Um, or uh, industrial state, strain design or uh, food production and safety. And we, we're writing, of course, some review papers to show the impact of this. This is less important. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is our two uh, applications. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, two applications of um, using artificial intelligence um, combined with, uh, with cell biology. Um, uh, for uh, first for environmental monitoring, and then um, I'm going to show you two examples uh, for healthcare, and then something at the uh, at the end is some kind of eye candy of some of something new that we are doing. Um, so just to give you an idea of how important it is to apply some of the things that we do um, in AI and machine learning that you do as a, as a group to a new field like biology, I want to give you a timeline of the research that we've been doing, some of the research that we've been doing in the center uh, since its inception, since 2016. One milestone that I want to, re to remind everybody is that the application of AI um, to, to cellular um, construction, starting from cellular image analysis, is brand new. Um, as I remember when I was starting, um, there was a very important paper by um, the group of Marcus Covert at Stanford. Uh, the first author is David Van Balen, uh, which was really one of the first example of using a convolutional neural network um, to segment the image of a cell. Until that point, really using uh, anything that was more than, a, let's say, than a standard unit on something, something like a, the image of a cell was, was really, uh, it was, was unheard, was unprecedented. And the reason for that is that uh, there are two main reasons for that. One is, of course, that there, was, that there was a very little application in general of machine learning and deep learning specifically to, um, uh, to the analysis of cellular images. But the second was also that the acquisition of cellular images at that time, I'm not talking about the history, I'm talking about you know, 20, when I wrote this grant was 20, 2014, um, uh, the, the uh, high throughput, high content acquisition of cellular images was really limited. We, we were not dealing yet with millions of images. And so it was really not, uh, I remember doing um, image analysis in the early days you know, 10, uh, you know, 15 years ago, using tools like ImageJ, right? So manual tools where you will segment by hand. Now, things have changed dramatically, but I want to show you how. So the center was funded, was funded in 2016. What I'm going to show you here are only um, uh, projects that uh, use um, uh, AI and machine learning. Um, <clears throat> and forgive me for this. I think there's a box that disappeared here. Um, at the beginning, what we started looking at was um, the classical problem of segmentation using um, uh, using um, some of this deep neural network. And, and, and we ended up using hybrid models, but that's a different story. But it, immediately, um, and I'm going to show you in a second, we uh, we worked on uh, biosensors. We had the availability of uh, an instrument that was capable of giving us uh, high quality uh, uh, images. Uh, a lot of high quality images. And so we needed to scale up analysis, uh, the analysis of these images. Um, and so the, let's say until 2018, we were really focusing on, on, on uh, uh, using um, off the shelf methods for, um, 
uh, for image analysis of uh, of some of these uh, some of these images. I think what made really a difference for my group was the development of uh, uh, a, an annotation platform called Quantius. Um, uh, that we published on Nature Methods uh, in 2018, where we introduced a new network um, uh, that will do a, a new regression network uh, that will uh, that was able to generalize for noisy annotation. So it, and it will allow, allow us to do to do large scale annotation using uh, non expert. And so that was was for us a breakthrough. Um, but then, um, without going into the details of the research, what happened from from that point on was really um, we could see that um, using new methods and developing new tools that were specific for image analysis um, would really increase uh, our understanding of the biological systems, but also, of course, um, allow us to speed up a lot of the processes. So we, we went from developing ad hoc tools to do image analysis of specific images to um, generalize from these tools to um, accelerate, let's say, the research. And, and then, so we started doing, we started also developing courses and doing a knowledge transfer, as we understand it, uh, uh, in um, uh, you know, students that would get machine learning jobs in biology, of course. Uh, the first company that was funded by an, um, somebody in AI and developing conferences uh, that were specific uh, that had a specific focus on image analysis. Um, now, going to now, um, this is again only a fraction of what we are trying to do. We are going from again this acceleration. So the first first was application of class, basically straight classification to uh, um, image to images uh, for detection segmentation and, and so forth to um, acceleration. And now we are we are in this new phase, which I think is going to be the, mo the the main focus of our center in the next few years, which is design. Can we use some of these methods to really design cells that do what we want to suggest design? And so we go into uh, things like reinforcement learning, generative models, and so forth. So we wrote we just wrote a grant uh, with Hannah and some other John Duber to develop a new AI center. Um, uh, to 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 develop these generative methods methods and IBM just funded uh, a project that I have which I'm going to show you in a second on the, uh, developing uh, AI tools to design immune cells uh, that fight cancer. Um, all right, so um, so what this means basically is so at we the first five years were really focused on um, uh, providing. Uh, uh, on, on generalizing tools that we uh, we uh, and developing new tools that we knew were working in other fields uh, to cellular image analysis. And so we innovated in uh, detection in 2D and 3D, segmentation in 2D and 3D, of course, annotation, as I was saying before, new paradigm for uh, paradigms for imaging, like this holographic microscope. Um, uh, and also um, um, uh, mixed algorithms, so algorithms that use both supervised and supervised learning. Um, as I was mentioning initially to uh, Matteo, uh, we have developed uh, algorithms for um, 3D tomography, uh, video tracking. Um, I was mentioning earlier detection from noisy, uh, annotation, deconvolution, and finally uh, explainable AI. So we think we really are pushing the boundaries using, uh, uh, so we're doing two things, right? So we're meeting in the middle. From one side, we are applying um, and innovating in uh, the analysis of cellular images and um, you know, not only methods to, to, uh, to understand images, but also to engineer images. From the other point of view, we are really trying to innovate uh, in, um, <clears throat> in machine learning and AI. Um, so that we can translate some of the things we have learned from this part to uh, new methods, new general methods uh, uh, to the other side. We're not there yet um, uh, because, well, frankly, unfortunately, I'm not a computer scientist, and so <laughs> I'm limited in my in what I can do with these things. But I'm, you know, we're we're really trying to uh, push the boundaries of, of both fields and trying to meet in the middle in this new discipline. All right, so, uh, so as I was saying, I, I forgot to put another slide here. The first thing that I'm gonna show you is about, about using 
um, some of our methods for environmental monitor monitoring to build monitors. Um, and then I'm going to show you something about design. Uh, and I'll show you an application to uh, SARS-CoV-2 since it's the topic uh, of the day. Um, all right. So, um, so um, you've probably seen this somewhere. If you're not, let me try and tell you uh, what this means. So um, um, our, our planet depends, of course, we depends, of course, on oxygen. Uh, maybe not, not everybody knows that two thirds over uh, about two thirds of the oxygen that is in the atmosphere now is um, not the product of, of plants, but is the product of small um, aquatic organisms um, called phytoplankton. Um, you, you probably remember plankton from your high school. Uh, you probably have forgotten about it until um, uh, until now, until you know. Um, uh, until somebody reminds you that it exists. Uh, but plankton is really at the bottom of the food chain. Over a billion people really depend on fish as their primary source of animal uh, protein. Uh, and so if you look at the, the food chain, they really depend on plankton. Um, uh, in, the, in the US, the impact of, uh, of fishery is uh, humongous. Uh, and so uh, being plankton at the bottom of the food chain and being plankton responsible for oxygen, plankton is very important. However, um, uh, um, as we we know, um, uh, climate change is real. So from the 1960s, the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has increased. And so it has the average uh, surface temperature of the planet of about one degree centigrade, which doesn't look like much to us, but it's a lot to plankton. So in the last um, uh, 50 years, um, uh, the population of phytoplankton has decreased of about 40%. This is, uh, this is a biomass measure from satellites um, that is an indicator of uh, plankton. And so um, the importance of it um, um, and uh, the fact that it's decreasing in some sense um, uh, pushes us towards finding solutions to understand um, what is happening to plankton, but also preserve it. And so what we're hoping uh, to do in some kind of ideal world is to be able, if you look to the left here, to be able to be develop as, um, a set of environmental sensors uh, that will monitor continuously plankton and will tell us if something uh, happens. For example, um, if there is an environmental runoff, like in this cartoon, that changes the plankton population, or if there is a change in temperature or salinity or uh, any other chemical and physical property of the ocean change uh, or in, uh, in population um, of, uh, of the small microorganisms that live in a specific area. And we want to extend this uh, globally, not only in a small region, but also globally. We can imagine in an IoT kind of world to um, uh, couple um, uh, hundreds or thousands of these small semi-autonomous or autonomous detectors that will then report their findings to uh, a, a cloud system uh, that then a researcher would be able to uh, sift to, maybe hope, hope, hopefully using uh, some kind of smart, uh, smart algorithm and then feedback. Um, so in order to achieve this, what we thought we needed was, first of all, a device that was smart uh, and also portable and autonomous enough so that it would be able uh, to, to do detection of these changes and at the same time um, an, an artificial intelligence that will power uh, this de device. And so this is exactly what we were supposed to do. And in order to do this, we thought we needed to change the paradigm. We invented a new microscopy ecosystem. So um, if you look here to the, the left, this is a conventional microscope that has a lens, it has a focus and a focal plane. Um, uh, on the right here, there is what is called contact photography. Uh, it works in the following way. If you have a, a film, um, I hope you can see my hands. If you have a film um, and you put, you put an object and you shine light, what happens is that the, the shadow of the object will be uh, impressed on the film. So what we developed is what is called a shadow microscope. Um, this was developed by my friend um, uh, Tom Zimmerman a few years ago. The way it works is um, you basically take this, so your uh, um, image sensor of your cell phone, there are about three billions of them around the world, probably more. You take the lens off um, and you get this image sensor. Um, 
if you put your sample here, for example, um, a drop of uh, plank of water with plankton in it, and you shine light, coherent light with an LED, what you get on the sensor is a shadow of everything that is there. Now, it, why is this important? It's because a shadow has um, needs no focus, right? And so this thing, if we do live imaging of these things, then these things will swim in and out of focus and you lose images. And this is what, this is how most um, microscopes work in the water. Um, they, they have a focal plane, uh, they have a lens, and so they either um, take images uh, and so they take snapshots or they, they lose a lot of information. A lot of these cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm gonna show you how much this costs in a second. Um, not only that, if you take now two uh, LED lights and you alternate them in an odd and an even fashion, what you get is a, you get two fields, an odd field and an even field. By coupling them, you can get, uh, you can get not only X and Y uh, for, for anything that is on the image sensor, but also Z from the, uh, from the coherence of these two. So you get uh, at 15 frames per second, uh, you can get X, Y, and Z of anything that is moving inside uh, this. And now uh, for the cost, this is two cents. This is probably $5. With less than $10, you have a microscope that is um, capable of um, acquiring high, uh, high frequency images, high quality images. Um, I'm going to show you what this looks like. So this is just a video. I think actually Vito took this video. Um, uh, this is a stentor. Uh, these things are moving uh, up and down. Uh, we see them uh, projected on, uh, on the plane. Um, this is only one of the two fields. If we have the two lights, we can also see in stereo um, uh, where they are going. So we see them swimming up and down. Um, now, why is this important is that, well, um, we know exactly what, uh, how these things are moving. We can track their movement. Uh, now, uh, uh, don't mind my computer, which is slowing down, but we can see them, you know, again, 30 frames or 15 frames per second if we have a uh, microscope, a stereo microscope. So we can get an outstanding uh, amount of imaging um, images out of this. Now, uh, of course, this was the first prototype. We need something better. Uh, you can't really see it well. So we developed what is called a, a digital online holographic microscope. And here, really, we, we are, uh, as many people usually say, we are standing on the shoulder of giants um, by taking you know, from Eugens, Young, Fourier, Fresnel, and Gabor, we, we have developed a, a microscope that basically um, um, uh, makes an, takes an holographic images, image of uh, anything that is swimming there. And then by using um, <clears throat> uh, Gabor's uh, theory and Fresnel's theory, we, we are capable of reconstructing with high accuracy um, whatever is in our sample. Now, this is our current uh, iteration. How much do they cost? Well, um, and, and this is why we need something smart. So we, uh, we, we couple the image sensor with a Raspberry Pi. This is about $40. Uh, the image sensor is $8. The laser is uh, $30. With le less than $50, we have an embedded system that is capable of acquiring high quality images in the field and looks like this, it's very small. Um, now, this is only one part of it, as I was saying. Um, we have all these images, what do we do with them? Um, well, we do need an AI. Why do we need a, an AI? There are over 4,000 known species of plankton, which means there are probably as many that are unknown. These are huge acquisition data sets. We have hundreds of thousands of images in uh, just a few days, actually millions of images in a few days of acquisition. Sometimes it's impossible to distinguish some features that the naked eye. We need, really need a, a machine. And of course, given there are so many images, we need scalability, we need many uh, of them. Now, this is something that I did for um, a non-expert uh, audience, uh, but you are an expert, so um, um, and I'm not going to focus so much on this. Supervised learning is um, out of the question for this because the, the training set would be impossible for anybody. I was reading a paper on nature um, that said that for plankton, only to, to, do, to make one training set for 10 images, it took two months. We don't have that kind of time. We don't have, we don't have to, that, to do that. And so what we re resolved to is to use unsupervised learning. Um, uh, and I'm going to show you what, what we try and, and do. And so what we need in the end to do this embedded system is an automatic uh, acquisition process 
um, in an open source environment that is capable of learning without supervision, supervision, capable of improving with new acquisitions and the ability of learning <clears throat> when there are anomalies. And so this is exactly what we built. Uh, we built what is called the Plankton Classifier. We published this, and Vito is the first author of this paper, scientific report. Um, it's, it's composed of uh, five independent modules, uh, a data acquisition module, an image processor, feature extraction, a partitioning module, the, which is unsupervised, and then an anomaly detection. And I think uh, you can probably go and read the details of this. I think what is important <clears throat> is the fact that this, this uh, system com combines, um, this system is completely unsupervised until it reaches um, uh, this part here, the partitioning module. And then it's still unsupervised, but it basically trains using the classes that it has recognized in the, uh, in the training set, um, um, uh, trains a, a number of uh, detectors, a deep learning detectors um, to do anomaly detection. Uh, so um, so this is, these are some of the results. This is um, 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 to show you um, uh, the separation uh, that we're capable of achieving um, using our clustering algorithm. And here, I'm sorry, this is a little small. I should have made it a little bigger. This is the diffusion matrix for uh, a data set that we have acquired with 10 species. We have excellent accuracy. <clears throat> and also with um, samples that have been acquired from other, with other uh, micros microscopy modalities, we have very good accuracy, which shows us that really this pipeline is capable of doing uh, what we think uh, it should do. And so, um, uh, so uh, you know, finally for this part, uh, really to go from here uh, to here, um, we have inserted a, uh, a, a system, an embedded system, deployable AI powered embedded system, which has a hardware component, which is this microscope that I was um, uh, describing and a software component, uh, which is this pipeline uh, that um, um, uses, uses unsupervised learning uh, to build classes that then <clears throat> can be used for anomaly detection. And that's another important part this anomaly detector, uh, which is basically a, uh, a set of uh, uh, deep, deep a set of you know deep networks um, that are trained on each of the classes that are um, um, uh, that are acquired that are uh, sorry that are um, uh, clustered by our clustering algorithm um, um, and um, uh, uses basically um, a an, an additional um, uh, an additional expands dynamically the uh, the the, um, the training set every every time there is uh, an anomaly or, or a new species. And besides the paper that I was uh, telling you about, we have also published a couple of patterns that specifically show uh, how this will work in an embedded system. Um, I'm going to pause for a second because I need a sip of water and then I'm going to go to the next part. You know, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, Simone, I, I, I will use this, this break because I, I, there, there is a curiosity that I, that, that I have and uh, um, it's, it's hard to say. So uh, I, I was wondering what type of uh, um, application scenario you have in mind. Uh, ah, specifically, yes. I'm referring to, so you, you've been talking about embedded systems and I was wondering if any of the software of the AI that you are developing is meant to go or is already on the embedded system. And uh, so if there's <coughs> applications uh, uh, of AI for your tasks should consider also that, uh, that aspect. We were discussing this with Vito and other colleagues like an hour ago about uh, how much uh, of our efforts uh, should be devoted to, to, to go more specifically uh, on the device. And this seems to be a very interesting example of that, I think. Right, so that's a great question. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer for you. So um, the, we, there are, there are, I think there are two ways to look at this. So the first is, we did make, uh, we did build the algorithm specific with, with the specific device we built in mind. So um, the algorithm that you see here um, that we published is tailored for um, the device that we built. And 
Um, and, and the idea for that was, we really wanted to build an integrated ecosystem. So we had an idea that we had to build uh, these uh, autonomous, these AI powered microscopes. And that's what we wanted to do. However, the algorithm is general enough that you can apply it to different image modalities. So much so that um, we can apply a similar, you know, a similar um, pipeline that you see on the screen on our holographic microscope. We need to add, of course, a, an image reconstruction step um, that is specific for the images that we acquire with that with that microscope. But uh, and and that right now is not AI powered. It's something that we do manually. Um, and it's time consuming. So one, one thing that we are doing is to try to in, in insert, so Laura Waller has, has written about this, try to insert um, uh, a, uh, an, an, a neural network or some sort of uh, um, um, algorithm, uh, faster algorithm to do image reconstruction. That being said, um, um, there are several devices out there um, that uh, use um, that acquire similar images. We're not, no, no means the only ones. We may have been one of the first ones to do something, to, to build something that's very cheap. But for example, my, my friend Manu Prakash at uh, Stanford has built what is called an Octopi, which is a, a modular, it's very funny actually, it's a modular microscope where you can swap uh, modules. Um, and it's also based on Raspberry Pi. So I guess the architecture is the same. Um, but what we what we tried is to use this kind of algorithm on that, and it works just the same. So um, I don't know if I if this answered your question, but um, my feeling okay. So this is would you need to devote time on the microscope? And the answer um, is yes, only if you have an idea that um, uh, relies specifically on that on that microscope, like we did, right? But in general, if you have a good algorithm, my feeling is that you can apply it to um, you know, to a lot of different. Now, the second question is what the what is the uh, the, uh, the hope for this specific? Now, um, we didn't, we never thought of this system as something we wanted to commercialize. Uh, it was never our idea. Um, we we open sourced. The, it's true that we patented the, um, uh, the anomaly detection, uh, but we open sourced uh, all the other algorithms and we open sourced the microscope. Um, so uh, it's not um, um, it, it's not our it's not our aim to really build millions of these. And however, we do have collaborations, um, for example, with uh, colleagues. Uh, here in the US to do uh, um, fish farms uh, that use some of these microscopes to, um, uh, to monitor continuously the, the water uh, quality. Um, and, and that's very important because for example, for, for, um, uh, for specific uh, farm, for specific fish, um, it's, it, you need to catch, um, you need to catch that the water is bad very early uh, or else it, it becomes impossible to stop uh, fish from dying. And so we think that using plankton, which is much more sensitive than a lot of other uh, chemical measurements, um, we can um, uh, we can do something. But we're doing this as a matter of collaboration, really. We're not doing it for commercial purposes. Now, and, let, and then I'm going to finish in a second. There is a, there is a long term idea that we have, which is to create a community uh, which uses these paradigms to, um, to do citizen science. And so uh, we are partnering with a company to produce these microscopes that can be sold at cost. So basically $20, you know, 18 euros, so that everybody can, can take them and put them in their little pond or lake and uh, acquire data and then be able to analyze it. I, I hope this answers your question, but if you, if, if you didn't, please feel free to. Um... No, no, it answers very well, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so maybe in the interest of time, I should go to the next uh, part. Now, as I was saying, image analysis, you can think about what we have done here as something general that we have applied it into a number of things. I'm gonna take the next maybe five minutes to describe a couple more projects. The first is AI's accelerators, and we're now moving into the realm of engineering. Uh, we want to engineer things. In order to engineer things, we need to measure specific quantities. And one of these is binding affinity, which is 
the strength of the interaction between two molecules. This is very important because when you are building a cell that is supposed to kill another cell or to bind to another cell, like a, like a cancer therapy, um, you need to understand, you need to know if this cell is going to bind to this cell. This is the binding affinity. However, this, is, this measure is incredibly expensive um, to, well, not incredibly expensive, but it is expensive to measure both experimentally and computationally. You need to do what is called molecular dynamics simulation. Um, these are simulations that run basically only on supercomputers and take on our summit computer, which, he, uh, which is you know, the fastest supercomputer on the planet, some of the things that we have take weeks. And so we, can't, we don't have that kind of time. Now I'm going to show you an application to uh, SARS-CoV-2 because that's what we have uh, as important. Uh, so <coughs> as you all know, you probably know more than you want to at this point, um, uh, the, the way that sa the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, uh, uh, enters the cell is by uh, binding uh, the spike, which you see here in this little cartoon, uh, to a receptor on, on our cell membrane called ACE2. And this is where the binding happens. Um, now, uh, in this conformation, this part here of the, of the binding domain enters ACE2, then the, the, the membrane opens, it's, it's really freaky, opens, and then the RNA of the virus gets in. Really freaky. Um, so uh, now you all know that um, SARS-CoV-2 is not anymore in its wild type form, let's say, but it has a number of variants. Uh, as well, let's say in the original form, but it has a number of variants. Each of, each of these variants is due to a, one or more mutations. And we know that several of these mutations happen in the contact area between the, the, the spike protein and the receptor bind and the, the binding uh, of the ACE2 binding of our cells. These mutations alter binding affinity. So imagine now that you're making a drug or something like that, and you want to understand whether um, your, your drug would bind to SARS-CoV-2, for example, um, then you need to know whether or not a mutation in the spike will escape, will allow the, the virus to escape. How do you do it? Well, you measure binding affinity. Um, so what we, so being something that you, that it takes a long time to measure, we wanted to find a way to accelerate this. And so we use AI. Um, we have a number of medically important variants like the English variants that is taking the world by storm. And we have their measured binding affinity here uh, we simulate them. So we basically simulate the dynamic of these things. So these things oscillate uh, like strings. And then at some point they either bind or they separate. And, and so um, we simulate the dynamic and we try to understand whether or not we need the whole simulation or we can use a, a small part of the simulation uh, to, um, uh, to understand whether or not the, the binding is higher or lower. Uh, given a certain mutation. We focus on this part, which is called the contact, um, the, 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 uh, um, uh, the contact area. And we build um, a distance matrix uh, from all this, what are called uh, C-alpha atoms. Um, and then what do you know? We transform this in an image um, uh, where on the x-axis uh, you have the receptor binding domain contact area and the y-axis you have the ACE2 contact area. Uh, each, each distance uh, between two atoms is encoded into a grayscale, uh, but into, into a value that becomes a gray, makes it a grayscale image. And then for each picosecond of simulation, we have uh, a different image. Now, this becomes a classical problem. Now, we, um, um, we train a convolutional neural network with a sample of these images um, from these uh, from this, this, this variants. Um, uh, uh, highlighted in blue. And then we ask the network, well, if I gave you one of these other variants that is in white, can you tell me what is a, its binding affinity is going to be? Is it going to be higher or lower uh, than a reference? Um, and so we use ensemble prediction. This is because, as you all know, the neural network uh, training is stochastic. Um, and so this is what you have, what we have. Um, I want you to look at the, uh, the orange uh, curve. Um, uh, first, if we look at the whole duration of the simulation, 160 nanoseconds take about a week. Uh, so make this for 12 of these. It's a, it's a lot of time. Um, 
of course, we can predict really well. Actually, this is not of course. It wasn't, it wasn't really guaranteed that a network would predict a binding affinity. So this is actually a pretty interesting result. With the full simulation, we can predict the binding affinity. But what is most important to us is that even with just 40 seconds, 40 nanosecond of simulation, which is a, less than a day, uh, we can predict with 100% accuracy the binding affinity of each of these variants, of course, separately. And this is the ensemble for 10 neural networks. So this is important because a new variant comes out in less than a day, we are, we are capable of saying, yes, this will bind better or this will bind uh, worse. And should we worry or should we not worry? Now, just to give you an example, the English variant is really the variant that is binding, uh, that is really, uh, it's most common now, uh, probably around the world. And um, it does bind much better than uh, the SARS-CoV-2 um, um, variant. Right, so, um, so again, towards engineering, I'm gonna give you one more example and then I'm gonna stop. Um, this is really, um, towards the engineering part. Um, oops, sorry. Can, oh, sorry. Can you see it again? All right. Uh, can um, AI help us design um, uh, design new cells? Now, this is a uh, project in collaboration with, uh, with Wendell Lim at UCSF. Um, and what you see here is um, um, a platform for uh, engineering uh, what are called chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Um, they work in a really, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but they work, this, this, are, this is really cutting edge research in, uh, in cancer therapy. The way they work is the following. Um, if somebody has cancer, we can extract their immune cells, their T cells from their organism. Then we can functionalize them by engineering new stuff into them. And then we re-inject them into the patient, hoping that they will work. Now, the important word here is hoping. This is done by trial and error. So um, you, we take um, the engineering part is basically we, we take parts of proteins which have known phenotype. For example, this here is known to confer cells killing abilities, right? And so we take parts of this protein and we put them into, um, into a new cell and we hope that um, uh, that cell is gonna kill cancer cells. And we do this in a combinatorial fashion. Um, we, we can engineer up to three uh, different uh, parts into a new, uh, into a, an existing cell. And we hope that you know, we can, we observe three, these three phenotypes. Uh, and now, so what we want to do is to use AI to be able to do that in a predictive fashion and to suggest design principles uh, for that. Now, uh, this is the data that we get. So each, each of these colors is basically a DNA sequence. Uh, we, we just numbered them, uh, one, two, 14. Now, probably the, the detail of the data is not important. What we measure in the lab is a change in activity. So uh, we have a first experiment, then we have a, a, a second experiment, and then we measure how much uh, the specific phenotype, how much the specific activity changes when we insert a, a, a little a stretch of DNA. Now, what we want to do is to try to predict that uh, using AI. Now, I'm not gonna show you the architecture because we're writing a patent, but I'm gonna show you how we encode the data. Uh, so um, we do two kinds of encoding. One is the position encoding. This is um, uh, DNA, imagine as this part here. Uh, we just say that this is um, in position one, uh, this is, uh, um, uh, 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 let, let's call it uh, DNA one, uh, and we put it in the first position here. This is DNA six, and we put it in this position here. And so um, if we swap them, then we would have that the orange part would be, would be first and the green part would be second. This would change the activity. Um, so the first thing that we do is a one-hot encoding on the position, uh, um, we have 14, um, uh, 14 uh, um, of these motifs, of these functional motifs. And so, as you all know, uh, one of the encoding puts a one whenever there is a, um, a when, when the, the position is occupied and so forth. And then we do an amino acid encoding. We basically encode each amino acid into a matrix. Uh, and then we, we train an unknown network, let's say. 
And I'm going to show you some, just some results. So what we do here now is we take part of the data, we train a network, and then we try to understand if, a, if we can predict that a completely new combination of the data is going to have a specific, um, uh, a specific phenotype. So here we try to predict whether uh, these specific triplets will be highly proliferating or, uh, or will not be proliferating. So uh, focus on the blue part. Here, we uh, this is CD4 cells. And here, we try to understand if this, uh, these uh, triplets are going to, have, are going to um, produce more antibodies or less antibodies. And what we do, is, uh, how, the way we do it is really well. Um, we, um, we basically take this, we go then to the lab, and we try to understand um, if what we predict um, is is uh, is true, and, uh, and and this is the just the the the, the score, the, the ground truth versus prediction uh, score, and um, uh, these are of course you know false positive, false negative, negatives, and the accuracy that we get in in predicting if things happen in this quadrant or this quadrant is really high. Now we we don't predict whether or not things fall on the line. That's less important. What we want to understand is if a certain triplet will have higher or lower activity than, um, uh, than, a, than a different one, than another one. Um, and we have two distinct data set. I just want to uh, um, make one thing clear. These data sets are really unique. Um, there are very few around the world of these data sets. They're incredibly expensive. And so they're very precious. This is why you see only a few points. Um, each of these points is <laughs> I, I, let, let not me put, don't let me put a price tag, but it's, let's say hundreds of thousands of dollars um, uh, to produce. And so um, in these two, these are two different, um, these are T cells that started from two different patients and um, the results are, um, are really good in terms of accuracy. Some, some of these are less good, but we're still honing. And, and this is prediction I forgot to tell you is on the amino acid sequence. So we're basically asking the network to predict the activity of a certain amino acid sequence, which is important then if we want to make uh, generative models. All right, uh, and then this is generalization. I think I'm out of time. The last thing I wanna show you for in one minute is um, uh, when we think about using AI as a designer, uh, we also think about, thing, think about things like reinforcement learning. As soon as the slide shows up, um, hopefully in the next second or so. There you go. Okay, so um, we have a uh, we have a technique which is called optogenetics, where we engineer um, a, a light inducible switch inside the cell. So basically, you 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 shine light on the cell, and the cell does something. Uh, in this case, the cell moves on command, and so um, the idea is: can we design a cell? Can we have an AI design a strategy? For a cell that moves in a specific way. Why is this important? Well, well, because we may want cell to go somewhere specifically without wandering around, right? And so using this light activity switch, we can have them move in a, in, in a certain way. However, there are a number of parameters, for example, for how long you need to keep the light on, when do you need to keep li light on, and this seems to be a perfect system um, for an automated learning uh, of, uh, of specific policies. Um, all right, so let me stop because I'm out of time. I'm so sorry. I want to thank uh, my group. Uh, um, uh, this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tom, who is the main engineer, uh, and Vito, who is there, um, luckily um, uh, for you, unluckily for us. Um, and my other postdoc, Sujoy, who is now uh, in uh, Kolkata, and my two current postdocs, Sarah Kaponi and Shangri Wang. And I, of course, want to thank the everybody in the CCC and the National Science Foundation for funding. Uh, I'm sorry I was out of time and I'm going to take any questions now. Thank you. No worries, Simone. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Is there any, any question for Simone? So if not, I, I do have one question, Simone. It's just a curiosity yeah. regarding the last part of your, of your talk. So it's more than a question. It's, yeah, it's a question, but it's actually, I, I, I'm curious to know your point of view on this. So um, it seems like also it's, uh, it's very hard in this field to get data, right? So according mm -hmm. to you, uh, what should be the percentage of, uh, of let's say, of, uh, of work 
uh, directed towards getting a correct data set for cells, which is very expensive. And I also think it's very hard to, to design, right? A, an acquisition yes. uh, procedure with respect to the AI design as well. So if you should wait the two things uh, for your experience, which is of course a very, a very great experience. So how will you, would you weight the two things? I don't know if the yeah. question is- Yeah, I can give you a general question, a general yeah, answer, yeah, yeah. a specific answer based on my experience. So the general answer is, um, it's very important to put uh, time on a, the correct design of the experiment uh, from two perspectives. The first is the experiment needs to give you, of course, what is biologically relevant, and uh, um, but also it needs to give you data that is of high quality, uh, high enough quality to train your network, right? Um, and so <laughs> if you have ever interacted with biologists, and I'm sorry if there is any biologist in the audience, uh, biologists just do experiments. They have their idea and they just do the experiments. They don't have in mind us um, as you know, data analysis modelers like I am. Um, and so, but I, I have to say my personal experience is that um, at the beginning of this en endeavor, uh, we were in that condition. We basically would get data without having any saying in how the data was acquired. Meaning that we had to really go great lengths to uh, design algorithms that would take this data and then get uh, interesting information out of it. And now this of course fosters a lot of innovation. However, it's also a waste of time in when you can really um, design the experiment so that it produces data that is amenable to a machine learning or a, uh, AI in general, you know, in larger sense algorithm. And so where we are now is that while at the beginning we were at the tail end of an experiment where you know somebody will tell us, hey, I've done this. Do you can you analyze this data? Because I think there's this biological effect. Now we are really in the middle. We uh, we when we collaborate, um, we decide together with the experimentalist how the experiment will need to be done so that the correct data will come to us. And this accelerated the research. And I think you can, you can imagine uh, why and how, but this accelerated the research dramatically. Uh, and in our case, I can, uh, you know, an example, for example, was the work that we did, uh, we did with the group of Mark Chan at San Francisco State on vacuole, uh, 3D vacuole imaging that we just published on physical biology. Uh, but there, at the, it was a nightmare because the, the, the data that we will get was, uh, was really not not good for for the kind of uh, algorithm that we had at that at that time. Now to the point where we have a um, uh, we have, we have work work that we are doing with uh, John Duber at UC Berkeley on uh, yeast peroxisome, where we are telling them, hey, our algorithm needs the data in this form, uh, or our algorithm needs this kind of data, or our algorithm algorithm would benefit from having. 2D positional instead of 3D information, right? So this is the kind of, uh, I think, back and forth and feedback that I hope we can be a good paradigm for um, that should go on. It, it should always be, you know, the, the people that make sense of the data should always be part of the, the, the data acquisition process. Now, it used to be that biologists used, also, used to be the ones who analyze the data. Now it's not so much so, uh, now there are people like us who analyze a lot of different data because of the methods that we can use. And so we need to be part of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. This answers uh, my, my question perfectly. So yeah, so the conclusion could be that it's not only important to analyze the data, but also to interact with the people that acquire data. So this discipline is a very hard one to work on because you need some knowledge, some very, very good knowledge also about the data itself, right? So you, you well, really need Yes, well, I mean, I think it's important for you, for you to uh, acknowledge the fact that you're not the expert of, yeah. you know, things like this one that you see on your screen. And so you rely on your collaborators to tell you what's important and what's not important. And you work with that. Of course, there's always a part of that. You don't have to know. And actually, the good thing about having high level collaborations like the one that we have, high level in the sense, you know, PI level collaborations, is that we, you really don't need to know the details of the biology, but you need to understand enough to be able to, uh, and to, to ask the right questions, to be able to, to uh, 
um, uh, to, to in, um, this help design these experiments. Yep. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, so uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you, thank you, Simone. Thank you all for attending.